Hi everybody, welcome to the first out of the three before three to succeed presentations that we're doing. Um, this first one is on birth to three learning and development for children who are age zero to three. Um, this is going to be an open discussion, so I want you guys to feel free to pipe in, talk about your own experiences. Um, the floor is open for us all to sort of co go through these slides together. Infants and toddlers, I know you guys all have experience working with infants and toddlers, they're all sensory motor learners, which is something that I know you guys are always aware of and working with clients and families to be able to explore. Um, their learning develops over time, so each thing they learn builds to the next thing, and so it helps to sort of keep going with learning. And um, you, as a provider, as a caregiver, and if you were to be a parent, are crucial to healthy development. Um, so sensory motor learning, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, the definition being um, that this is the direct physical approach to learning that uh, young children utilize. Sensory, the word sensory refers to the way that we gather information through all of our senses. Can anybody name all of the five senses? If the brain's working, yeah, there you go. Taste, smell, sight. sight. Vestibular? Oh, yeah. did you say like hearing? hearing? So, hearing. Oh, no, no, no. hearing. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were. <laughs> you went super <laughs> science <laughs> with it, <laughs> and I loved it. But um, so, yeah, so we've got um, sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. Um, so these are the things that we want to explore with babies as they're learning and growing, as they're um, as their brains are developing and the lessons that they're learning are helping to sort of um, instruct how they interact with the world. Um, the word motor, of course, refers to the way we learn through physical action. So being able to explore our senses um, with, use, with walking around, with touching things, stuff like that. So um, let's talk about brain development a little bit because that plays heavily into the sensory motor learning. Um, brains grow and learn the way they are nurtured. So kids who get a lot of um, attention and a lot of moments to explore and learn um, allows their brains to develop with those lessons, whereas kids who don't experience those um, don't have that advantage. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, neural pathways, or those are the connections that develop in our brain, uh, they need to be exercised and strengthened. Nobody comes with their full blueprint of all they need to know the moment that they're born. For us as humans, we need to learn. Okay, and like most other animals. Um, the last thing on here is the optimal window, optimal window um, of opportunity to do this is called the critical period. So um, this is when consistent active stimulation from the environment is important to develop specific abilities. This critical period is the time where it's best absorbed through your head. So that's why like young kids, um, like learning a language is a lot easier to a young child than it is to an adult because as their neural pathways are being um, created and strengthened, they're um, able to make that happen more than someone who's already has those neural pathways set. It's a lot harder to teach an old dog new tricks. The richer our sensor, sensory environment the, and the greater our freedom to explore it, the more intricate will be the patterns of learning, thought, and creativity, which really just builds on what we were talking about with that. Um, I have a picture here that's really going to help to illustrate that. Um, so on the left, I have a picture of a healthy brain, a healthy developing child, um, a child who is getting um, attention from caregivers, um, allowed to play with toys and explore their environment and build on their skills with their sensory motor, sensory motor learning. And then on the right, I have a photo or a picture, a brain scan of the brain of a child who was um, sort of deprived of that ability. Um, this picture happened to be from um, a Romanian orphan who was institutionalized so shortly after birth and um, in the institutions because their orphanages were overflowing at the time due to a war in the country, they, um, the children didn't receive much attention. They spent most of the time in the crib by themselves. Um, they didn't really get a chance to play with toys or explore and build their sensory learning skills. Um, so let me throw this out to you. Anything that you notice that's really different about these pictures? Well, um, the, 
abused child's brain, as you can see, there's a lot of non-active areas um, mm -hmm. in his brain. Yeah, absolutely, Faith. I agree with that observation because the um, the child wasn't able to really exercise these neural pathways. Um, there's considerably less of the red and yellow colors that we see and much more of the black um, and this purpley blue color. Um, the circled areas are the temporal lobes which regulate emotions and receive input from the senses. Um, they're mostly um, inactive from this child. So um, this is a very sort of visual way to show how when children's brains are developing, how important it is to let them sort of explore their environment. Um, any questions or comments? No? It's interesting how um, history can allow us to be able to do those studies where in research you can't intentionally do that to someone, but with unfortunate circumstances like that, we can have, um, we can learn a lot about brain development. Um, so there's um, another illustration we have up here that really helps to show us with neural pathway development. Um, this uh, goes from newborn, and these little lines in here would be an illustration of neural pathway development. Um, so the amount is, um, there's a few in there. Newborns are born with a few things. Kids are born able to what, grasp, open and close their eyes. Some kids smile really early, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then at one month we can see, I think the neural pathways are kind of doubled. That's what it looks like to me. There's um, a lot more going on. Kids just in the amount of one month are developing um, many more skills, thoughts, conclusions about the world. Um, and then from one month to nine months, which is kind of a bigger jump, we've got way more going on. We've got lots of synapses firing in there, a lot of things floating around, a lot of learning going on. And when we think about what a kid's doing around nine months, there's um, a, a lot more they're able to do between one month and nine months. Um, then the jump from nine months to two years is also much bigger and noticeably there is a lot going on in there. We've got kids, what, by two years walking around, using more words. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, recognizing people, um, learning maybe a little bit about the cause and effect of actions, things like that. Um, so it's really hectic in there and we can imagine being a two-year-old why they might call it the terrible twos because there's just so much going on inside. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then as an adult, we've got um, the last part on here, we've got some synapses that have been strengthened. You can see from this picture to this picture, there's some thicker chunks in there of lessons that we learned over time of, I don't know, walking more steadily, cause and effect. Those are just the things I can think of right now. Um, but there's also less of these little ones going out there, right? We've sort of pruned away. We've gotten rid of these synapses that weren't as effective, that we didn't really need to know. Um, so that's that. Does that kind of mirror the work that you're doing with? When we were speaking about language development, are those synapses like making, like if you were to try to learn a new language, it's like delaying delaying your ability to comprehend a whole new language? I think so. I think it could just be that as an adult, we sort of are already set in our pathways. And as a two-year-old, we've got a lot of path new pathways forming, a lot of things that we're learning. Our intake from the world is like way, uh, it's quick and, um, and, and effective. And as an adult, we've sort of gotten set in our ways of things like language or, um, I don't know, I'm guessing, but it could be harder to learn to like skateboard as an adult than if you were to start off a little younger. Don't quote me on that, that's sad. There's no research behind it. But, um, but we get set in our way of balance or language and um, that doesn't mean it's impossible. Yeah but it's just much easier as kids learn. And we see this in the work that we do with um, young children having an easier time learning a second language or, I don't know, making friends. <laughs> just kidding, adults can make friends too. Okay.
So let's talk a little bit more um, diving into the process of active learning. This is learning where um, you can actively participate and explore and develop in, in that sensory motor way. Um, so up here, children love what they're doing, um, which really helps in learning. They love what they're doing if it's something that they're interested in, if it's enjoyable to them, if they have some control over the situation, they can make some choices. Um, if there's a probability of success, no one wants to keep working at something that's, uh, that's yeah, discouraging. Um, and they feel competent in doing it, where they can sort of feel that, um, that reward and get that confidence as they practice. Um, so active learning goes much better when kids are enjoying what they're doing, when they're loving it. Um, which as people who work with kids and who've been in the classroom, I know you know all too well, right? Following what they are interested in in the moment is really important. Yeah. Yeah. If kids aren't having fun or enjoying, if they're not loving what they're doing, uh, good luck trying to get them to do it, right? So um, these are things that we want to think about when we're trying to promote learning in children um, because that's really going to help us and make our lives a lot easier as parents, as caregivers, as teachers, um, and as early childhood providers. So there are five components of active learning. We want to think about the materials that we're using, um, the ability to explore, allowing choices to be made within reason, of course, um, promoting language use and supporting or scaffolding, we might call it, um, during the process. So let's talk about all these individually. Um, so materials, playing with a variety of materials and objects allows for learning with a variety of senses. So we've got some examples on here. Um, any comments or ideas about what we can get from these objects? when it comes to like the truck with the brooms and the beep beeps and the bouncing of the ball and things like that. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot you can do Direction with Direction things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The action of being able to actually be allowed to hit something and for it to make noise mm -hmm. and different pieces making different noises. Cause yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Being able to build something up and knock it down, we all know that's sometimes one of kids' favorite things to do. Um, and also different weights of different objects. And learning about how you know this one can roll around and move, but I don't know about like throwing this guy around. That doesn't make sense. Um, probably not good for the xylophone. Okay, so next up, exploration. Exploring and manipulating objects encourages this sensory learning that we keep talking about and improves motor skills and you can practice cause and effect. So let's talk about the different things we can learn from this apple. Right now, just this picture on the screen, what can you learn about this apple here? It's red. Cool. It has a stem. All right. It's round. Cool. It's shiny. Cool. I agree with all those things. Anything else you could learn about it? Well, on this screen is Just, right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's a big apple. <laughs> I've never seen an apple that big. Um, okay, so that's five. Um, anything else? Um, the stem is green and brown. Okay. All right. Now, imagine if I were to give you a plastic apple that looked like this. Hmm. What things could you learn about that apple? But if you were allowed to hold it in your hand and touch it. I know that it was hard, okay. smooth, shiny. You even know the like size, most likely. The color. color. Yeah. So we went from six things to eight things. Cool. We're increasing. What if I handed you a real apple? You could taste it. Yeah, yeah there you go. You could taste you could smell it. it. You could smell it. If you cut it open, you would see that it's a different color on the inside and that there's seeds. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Different texture. And still maybe all the things we knew before, right. that it was red, it had the stem, shiny. it's round and shiny. Um, you could hear when you cut it open, if it's a good apple, it's got that crisp to it, right? In apple season, if we're lucky. Um, so in a re with a real apple, we can learn much more, much, much more. Um, so this is sort of a uh, live action demonstration 
to um, really exemplify how direct exploration, being able to um, check something out in real life, really helps us to sort of learn these little lessons that life has to give. Um, so choice, providing choices can help facilitate critical thinking in children, which we know is really important to help build up. Um, we want to also help um, provide that sense of self-control and independence, and um, that is helped by letting kids choose not only what to play with, but also how they can play with an object. So instead of just giving you that plastic apple and saying, Autumn, you need to hold it. Just hold it right there in front of your face. Okay, now smell it. Okay, now throw it. There uh, wouldn't maybe be as fun for you if I just handed it to you and then let you make your choice, right? You're learning your cause and effect of things. So choosing maybe playing with a rubber ducky versus a blue rubber ducky, it's a little bit bigger, versus a real ducky. <laughs> I'm not saying I recommend that. <laughs> Could be a risk, I don't know. Um, but it does sort of uh, exemplify maybe in a controlled situation in a petting zoo or something like that. And then of course a larger than life ducky which I think we would all like to um, check out. Isn't that cool? Um, <laughs> so providing that choice when possible if you can um, but of course it doesn't have to be with duckies. Next up promoting language. So language and communication development uh, is reinforced by language that's provided um, during play and the permission to participate in communication, learning that back and forth um, is a pattern that we want to get kids in the practice of from day one, that, um, that speak and response. Um, one fun way to learn about communication is reading, but reading, everyone knows Chicka Chicka Boom Boom, right? Um, one of my favorite books, because not only is it reading, you get the book, you've got the pictures, but there's a song, and the song has a good beat to it, a good rhythm. Um, so promoting language through reading and music um, is always much easier for us, because it's something that's a bit guided, so we don't even have to really um, be memorizing anything or whatever, so we're able to really explore things with kids alongside them. Um, I got some instruments, but does anybody have any other ideas of ways um, you could promote language? Like as a caregiver, especially for infants, it is so important to try to, even though you know they're little babies, it's so important for you to try to use, you know, um, words with them instead of using the quote unquote baby talk with them. Mm -hmm. And I and I think that a lot of people, you know, you're just babies are so cute and you go boo boo gaga and all of that. But I think it's so important that you, you know, speak to them. Like for me personally, I've always been taught like when you're talking to infants, you would speak to them as if though you're expecting a response. Even though you know they're not going to respond back, you're still giving them that language at such a young age, and then they'll be more likely um, to develop that language by what, age two, mm -hmm. one or two. Yeah, absolutely. I think some amount of baby talk can sometimes be uncontrollable when you see a cute baby. You're just like, oh my god, I love you so much. So, um, so I totally agree with that, though. Being able to also pepper in actual words and sentences gets kids even from a very young age where they might not be understanding what you're saying or that you're, um, you know, or exactly what you're asking. They're knowing that you're talking to them and they're getting familiar with the pattern of speech um, and, and different words. All right, the last part here on active learning is support. So um, as a caregiver, a parent, or a uh, provider, we're always looking how to, um, how to give the best support in learning for children that we know and love. Um, supportive play involves using accessible language, which is part of what you were saying, Faith. Um, we're talking about what just happened, what's happening now, what may happen next as we're playing or as we're just going around through our day, allowing our kids to really 
um, be, get, it, get that knowledge base or those words, that vocabulary to be able to understand what's going on. Also helps to give them sort of moments to be able to recap and understand what just happened, moments to know what's happening now. And kids always, I know we all know, giving kids a heads up about what's going to happen really helps you in your day in moving things that need, uh, moving along to different tasks. Um, was something we touched a little bit on before, learning um, through caregiver support, when I talk, you listen. So then when you talk, I can listen. Knowing that pattern of speech, of communication, that um, culturally is appropriate, getting that in at an early age and just building that in to children's, um, to, to, so kids just do it unconsciously really helps with even just learning to be polite, considerate. It sort of feeds into other things. I know we've all had experiences with that where kids are struggling to uh, work with that concept. So building that in as we go really just helps to reinforce. Um, uh, caregiver support during play encourages problem solving, but we want to make sure that we do, um, we hold patience while we do it. We're not always wanting to do everything for kids, but allowing kids to problem solve on their own and stepping in when necessary. Um, if a kid can use some help, really helps to give them that sense of um, independence and self-control, but also if we step in a little bit to help, that sense of success um, and confidence. Um, responding to and acknowledging any cues and communication about feelings and reactions during play. This doesn't even have to be with words. This could be with an infant, watching their facial cues, their body. Um, they will let you know if they don't like something or if they're trying to understand something or if they're focusing on one thing. We as caregivers, parents and practitioners, um, are all usually paying attention to our children and really noticing, oh, you are looking at that ball? Wow, you really like that. Uh, look how shiny it is or look how it bounces, things like that. Um, and then lastly, you're communicating with warm, warmth and genuine interest during support really helps. Sometimes we get busy and we, you know, have to be doing other things and we're distracted, but taking some time throughout the day and being genuinely interested in kids really helps to promote that confidence, knowing I'm important, what I have to say is important, what I want to learn is important, um, my thoughts and feelings are being heard, and, uh, you know, kids are a great uh, they're, they're great observers. They know when you're faking it. <laughs> so really taking time to, to genuinely be warm and interested in what they say matters because kids can tell um, when we're not really um, putting that out there. And then, of course, young children who are able to form positive, trusting relationships with their caregivers are then able to summon the courage to explore their world. So good caregiver support um, in any form of caregiving really helps kids to promote that confidence to be able to, um, to learn more lessons and explore. Any thoughts about that? It doesn't only just take place during playtime with toys, that it's something that can happen all day. So like going back to materials and things like that, it can be a paper towel roll or a newspaper or kitchen utensils mm -hmm. or you know something in the bathtub that you have, like a cup or something like that, that you can play and explore with in different ways. So even if you don't have access to maybe a ball or a teddy bear or a xylophone, there's still ways to incorporate active learning into every single day. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for transitioning to the next side. Uh, because, <laughs> yeah, you were like right on my wavelength. Um, basic care rituals and routines are everyday moments that are filled with active learning, just like Charlotte was saying. So some of your routines um, with working with children, feeding these moments. There, this is your bowl, check out your spoon, this is your bottle. Um, every day we feed our children, hopefully, if not. Come talk to me. Um, so every day we're providing not only nourishment in feeding, but also an opportunity for that caregiver bonding time and exploring our sensor motory learning. 
Um, moments of bodily care, like you said, in the bathroom. Um, so moments where you're either changing diapers or using the potty or we're getting dressed or we're um, bathing or washing or brushing our teeth. We're helping not only for our children to maintain hygiene um, and be physically comfortable like diaper changes, things like that, um, but we're also contributing to their emotional well-being, showing that they're cared for and that they're being supported. Um, and, you know, we can talk about our day, we can talk about the um, characteristics of objects that we're using, um, we can maybe allow some choice in getting dressed, um, things like that. And we're also learning to explore our motor skills with uh, like holding the toothbrush or even just feeling the bristles in your mouth, things like that. And then, of course, sleep. Every uh, person, every human that I'm aware of sleeps. Um, sleep provides our bodies um, time to recharge physically, mentally, and emotionally. It's the same exact thing for kids. Um, bedtime and nap time rituals provide that comfort of consistency for children. Um, talking about our rituals or our, our patterns as we do them helps kids get comfortable with bedtimes, which I know can sometimes be difficult. And um, they also help children develop um, healthy sleeping habits, um, which I know is so important, not just for them, but for us as caregivers, parents and providers. Life is so much easier when your kids are um, sleeping well. Less cranky, typically. And myself, I'm less cranky when I'm sleeping better, right? Yeah, cool. So any thoughts on these points here? We sort of ran through them quickly, but I know you guys all have you know, your own experiences working with kids, with parents, with families, and developing these, um, these skills in children and really helping um, as caregivers to remind ourselves that the things we're probably naturally doing all the time um, really promote our children in ways that we don't always think about. Okay, so let's dive into planned activities. I know as caregivers, parents, providers, we're not always able to plan activities in our day. Sometimes we just need to go to the grocery store or you know, run a different errand or we need to clean up or you know there's things that we have to do but in moments where we're able to find some time planned activities can be really helpful for kids um, there's a few things to keep in mind um, we want to be sure to take time every day every week as much as we can to play slow to be patient to not rush through things, to allow kids to have that time to explore and really use that sensory motor learning and get those experiences. Uh, we want to remember it's good to get loud sometimes when possible. Yes, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know, me too. Yeah. yeah, get it out. Kids are loud creatures and it's and I find that probably much of their day, and we can all, you know, find that too, that kids are being told, shh, keep it down, relax. And sometimes you just got to, like, get that out. So it's good to find moments where we can be loud. Um, and also when we can be messy. Kids need to get messy sometimes when possible, within reason. But we need to allow for those moments where kids can have that freedom, get messy. That also learns about feeling messy and cleaning up afterwards, you know? Like, what does it feel like when I have stuff all over my face? And maybe that's not as enjoyable as I get older, things like that. Um, and planned activities uh, really do help to prepare your child for success in school. Learning about, okay, we're gonna start this now. Look how we're having fun after that. Okay, we're gonna clean up, put everything away. Having that set sort of structure of um, like set up, play, tear down, really helps kids develop that pattern being able to work in a school setting. Um, some other things to consider when planning activities. Um, how can we utilize our sensory motor learning that we learned about? Um, what choices can we allow and provide for our children to make? Um, how can we be able to explore and or solve problems when we're playing or letting our children do those things? Um, how can they learn to make mistakes? Well, we want to allow kids to be able to make some mistakes. That allows them to learn from them, um, within reason, of course. 
Um, and then how can we promote the use of language or communication during our play together? And how can we as caregivers support, participate, and enjoy our time? All right. So first planned activity, we have an example here on the table. We've got treasure baskets. Um, I think a few of you already know a bit about treasure baskets. Um, but treasure baskets are a cool way for children to be able to have supportive learning within the frame of, um, of time that you allow and within like one set basket. So anybody could have um, just a basket full of household items, things that are, um, it doesn't have to be exactly a basket, a box or a container, um, things that are all different that really promote exploring all five pillars of active learning. So if you want to check out this basket here, um, each side I guess can share one or yeah. Uh, I know. <laughs> yeah, there's a few different things in there. Um, items in the basket can vary by weight, size, texture. I can't believe that fits you, Faith. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, uh, weight, size, texture, color, taste, temperature, sound. Everything in the basket is okay for kids to pick up, touch. It's clean, so if they put it in their mouth for a minute, it's something that we shouldn't have to worry about. And we can take the toys out, we can use them in the time frame allowed, and when we're done, we can put these toys all back in the basket, wash them if needed, and you can keep it on a high shelf. All of these toys and the things in here are designed to be explored with a parent support. So I don't know if naturally we might want to give like that paintbrush or something like that, right? We always want to be available to observe and um, make sure kids are being safe and participate, describe. So let's take a moment. Faith, can you describe to me what you're playing with a little bit? What happens when I bounce it down up and it lights up. Oh, I found. So oh, my fell off. <laughs> All the items in here were bought from the dollar store, so these don't have to be fancy okay. toys, right? They, they, um, those might have been two dollars. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be incorrect. The light in there is a little fancy, but, um, but nothing in here is overly expensive. Um, these baskets were all a dollar each, um, so they're. Uh, fun for kids to be able to take a time. Sometimes you don't need fancy stuff. I think we've all experienced that when uh, you take something out of a box and you can give a kid like you provided a new toy and sometimes the only thing they're interested in is the cardboard box that it came out of and that box could go for weeks of fun play um, where the toy that just you got money spent on um, is less interesting. So sometimes even the most basic things. Um, <laughs> Charlotte, what are you playing with? Strings on it, so I could wear it like a bracelet. I can spin it on my finger. Mm -hmm. I can pull it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's soft and it's soft. squishy. It's a little sticky, probably. Yeah, it kind of feels weird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's soft and squishy. It's a little sticky, probably. Yeah, it, kind of feels weird. <laughs> it feels weird. It could feel if you were exploring with your mouth, that would feel like really yeah, I was weird. Say, this would probably go right in a baby. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's why we talk about parent support during Treasure Basket, wanting to explore stuff and get the freedom to touch stuff like that, but you're right there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if kids have teeth, you're really making sure, like, we're not biting those little pieces off or hurting themselves or anything like that. Or typically we don't really want our kids playing with things like pine cones or cinnamon sticks, but if we're there to support, what a cool thing to smell or touch, maybe not taste the pine cone, but, but maybe the cinnamon sticks. Um, but the toilet paper roll is on here, not just because that would be a cool thing to explore, but what sort of the going theory would be is if it's small enough to fit into the tube of a toilet paper roll, it's probably too small to put it in a treasure basket. So that would be sort of the rule that we would want to put towards collecting these treasure baskets is almost anything can go in there um, as long as, yeah, we're being safe. Um, and everybody, I mean, typically we all use toilet paper, so we've all got something like that at home where we can use sort of as a measurement. Things that have different sounds too, right? We've got the harmonica or the bell on here, allowing for those times to be loud and have fun. Um, I put a toothbrush in here because household items can be fun to explore and, um, and take time to look at in a way that's not task oriented. So toothbrushing time can be sometimes difficult for families um, and for children. It's a weird 
feeling, especially if somebody else is brushing your teeth, you don't have that control. Um, so having moments during the day where you're allowed to explore a toothbrush and do it for yourself can really help to ease those moments when things have to be done. Um, any other thoughts or ideas of what might be fun in a treasure basket? Making a sponge? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Pitt. Um, I didn't put that on there, but I love that idea. And that would be really cheap at a dollar store, you know? We want things that are um, easy to get to and, um, and not expensive, because these don't have to be things that you pay, um, pay a lot of money towards. So I like the measuring spoons too, because they're all different um, sizes and colors. And of course, we already talked about how fun it is to use blocks to build stuff knock stuff down, um, having those moments of that cause and effect learning. Um, and they can be in um, natural uh, materials as well. Would um, I put a rolling pin on there. Typically we don't think about using that as a toy, but what a cool weird thing to play with to spin it and hold it, especially if it's really heavy, you can roll it on the ground. Um, so yeah, oh, and the, these are empty spice containers. So um, if we're ever, you know, using spices and we have an empty container, throwing that, you know, you can clean it out a bit, but throwing that in a treasure basket really allows um, to explore smell, to open it up and smell it. Even if it's not in there, those containers are still going to smell. Mm -hmm. So um, I found that one online. I was really excited by that idea. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then next up, the most exciting, um, <laughs> which I know we were already talking about, um, our pl is Play-Doh, homemade Play-Doh. Um, one of uh, children uh, typically love Play-Doh, but I know we as adults, we love Play-Doh too. Um, I've got these little booklets that we made here at Oakland Family Services that have um, all the recipes that you're about to look at. Um, I looked up just with a quick Google search, anybody could do it as well. Um, a few different Play-Doh recipes that can be fun to make at home. Um, we can buy Play-Doh, but sometimes it can be a little overpriced. And if you have some of these ingredients at home, you can make your own and then you know what's going into it. Um, so there's a classic Play-Doh recipe. Um, that classic Play-Doh recipe does involve cooking, um, but it's a great way for kids to be able to explore those um, well, all these options. Great way to explore that sensory motor learning, those fine motor skills. Um, the classic Play-Doh recipe doesn't taste very good, um, which is a nice lesson to learn. It's all natural, so it certainly doesn't hurt, but um, there's a lot of salt in it, so it's not um, a pleasant thing. So we found also this edible, gluten-free, no-cook Play-Doh. Um, so for uh, families who are gluten-free, sometimes playing with Play-Doh can be a horrible minefield because kids always want to put everything in their mouth and exploring. So this is an option that uh, really can resolve that stress of it. Um, and it's no cook, so anybody could use it and then not have to worry about the cooking element of it. And it just uses rice cereal. If you happen to have cornstarch and applesauce, vegetable oil, you're good to go. These are um, products that many families have. Um, right there in their cupboard or fridge I guess applesauce I don't know all right next one we have kool-aid play-doh this one's cool because it helps us explore smell the kool-aid play-doh also has a ton of salt in it it doesn't taste very good but it smells so good yeah so <laughs> yeah and the um, the Kool-Aid packet still provides color to it, so it's a fun way to explore that if something smells good, it might not always taste good, but it might look cool. Um, so hopefully it doesn't dye anything much. Um, but even then, it's fun to get sort of messy. Um, put, you can put um, newspaper down or placemats or just use a table that doesn't matter as much. Um, next recipe, edible uh, peanut butter Play-Doh. So this one has a lot of sugar in it, uh, so you can imagine it, it tastes probably pretty good as long as there's no peanut allergies. Um, this Play-Doh will sort of dry a little bit. It'll, it'll um, air dry if you leave it for an hour or two. Then you can stick them in an airtight container or a Ziploc bag, and, what, um, and the creations can be used for snack later. So it's a fun way to be able to explore our sensory motor learning, to get messy, to have fun, and then you got a fun snack. 
Um, next one, melted ice cream Play-Doh. It smells really yummy. Um, and if you've ever played with cornstarch before, it acts like a salad when you scrunch it up. But once you let that go with surface tension, it'll melt and fall. So it's very weird. It's a very weird texture. I know, I can see you smiling. <laughs> it's fun to play with, even as adults. It's like really weird. Um, so if you have cornstarch and then um, this uses like the refrigerated um, dairy-free coffee creamers, like Coffee Maid or whatever um, brand you want to use. Um, and then you can choose whatever flavor you want and that will make it smell really good too. And the last one here, arguably one of my favorites, um, is the edible Play-Doh pasta dough recipe. So this recipe is really a pasta dough and um, you can play family time and make as many, uh, you make a big batch and everybody can make their own little figurines, shapes, whatever we want. And then um, you can use it later, boil it and make it for dinner. So yeah. I know. It's a cool way for people to, or for kids to be able to participate in making dinner and just add whatever toppings your family likes. Or no toppings, I guess. But I like toppings on my pasta. Um, but yeah, how cool is that to make your own pasta and have that fun for a kid to make their own and then be able to eat their own shapes later? How cool is that? You probably just want to keep your shapes to the small side so the pasta cooks through. Cool. The more that this Play-Doh is played with, the better your noodles will be. Um, that's what's set on the site. So that's even more fun for kids to be able to um, play around. All right. So any other thoughts on Play-Doh? I just think Play-Doh is fun. I wish I could be playing with it right now. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I'll make you some. You can play with it later. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so the last slide on here, just a reminder, our Before 3 to Succeed initiative through Oakland Family Services offers tools that you can use to help your baby grow and thrive. We have a few programs here and represent representatives of those programs of the ELC um, and the CLC, and, uh, or, um, which is the Early Learning Center and the um, Children's Learning Center that we have here, um, which is our preschool. And then we have our Early On program, um, we um, have a lot of those services, but also just a way to make sure that um, you as parents and caregivers can check on how your children are growing and developing. We use the ASQ, the Ages and Stages questionnaire. Um, we have a free link for anybody, any time of day, um, can use to check their children from zero to five years old, um, as many children as you want, absolutely for free, as many times as you want, to look at um, how your children are growing in comparison to um, other kids their age. We look at language and communication, fine, and, uh, fine motor skills, which are those um, well, gross motor skills, which are the big muscles like running, walking, jumping, fine motor skills, which is the smaller muscles, especially in our hands, like pinching, writing, um, opening, yeah, stacking, cutting with scissors, playing with Play-Doh, yes. <laughs> yeah, play exactly. Um, problem solving skills and personal social development. So um, all these topics are um, added as questions on the thing and the, then you can get um, scores to see how your children is developing in comparison to other kids their age um, to just confirm that your kid's growing and thriving and helps to show you if there's any areas that you could um, focus on more with, the, with your children to help get them back up to the level that they might need. So um, this link is available any time of day, um, absolutely for free. And that's it, everybody. 